The, um, the, let's see, contend lawfully is our passage, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, and if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. When I was becoming a preacher back in the 1900s, none of your business, we had, uh, we had uh, illustration books. Does anybody remember those? We had to have illustration books, and we needed to figure out illustrations for our lesson. I tell our guys in school now, you don't need to do that anymore, you need to read the headlines. Sermons just pretty much write themselves, don't they? Unfortunately, you got illustrations and applications of all kinds of things. Well, for this one, what happened a few weeks ago is quite the illustration, isn't it? No one is crowned unless he competes according to the rules. I saw this from a lesson from Hiram Kemp up at uh, Bowling Green, heard about it before that. And here's what happened in this half uh, marathon in Beijing. These three Kenyans were way out in front of this Chinese fellow and these three Kenyans kind of stopped, pointed him to the finish line till he crossed, and then they all came in second together. There was an investigation, and they were all stripped of their medals. Because they, they don't know exactly what happened. I don't know exactly what happened. Some people are saying there was some confusion that the gentlemen from Kenya were hired in order to set the pace, and they weren't really participants. But that doesn't, I don't know if that washes or not. But there's a great illustration of our passage, isn't it? Unless you contend lawfully... You're not crowned. If anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. We uh, might think of some other people along those lines. You might think of Pete Rose. You might think of Barry Bonds. And there's controversy about all those things I know. But that's the issue, isn't it? Did they compete according to the rules? Can they be in the Hall of Fame because of that? I put up this volleyball slide because I'm reminded of camp volleyball. Has anybody ever heard and <laughs> played volleyball at camp? Now, Volleyball at camp is sorted by the rules, <laughs> you know. We don't do the exact bump and spike the way you ought to and all that sort of thing. But one time I was at camp and we were just playing and so we had some people that weren't very athletic, just like me. And we were playing around and we just kind of forgot all the rules and there was just absolute chaos to the point that nobody was having any fun. You can go to one extreme and just be so strict about everything that you never have any fun. You went, we went to the other extreme weren't going by any rules, just hitting that ball back and forth. Nobody was having any fun. We had to step in and say, here are some rules. Here's what we're going to do. No one is crowned in athletics unless he competes according to the rules. The contention of this passage is the universality of it, that here we have three examples of strength in this passage, as you've already heard from two excellent speakers. You have three examples of strength, the soldier, the athlete, and the farmer. You've heard about the soldier. You've heard about the athlete from me, you'll hear about the farmer next, and then we'll be asked to think about it. In this passage where we're told to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, verse 1, and teach the things to other people, verse 2, which Gail spoke about, and then be, take hardships as a soldier, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And then verse 5, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The Greek word is athleo, where we get athletics. But Paul loved that word. Paul used that word a lot. There were games in the time of Paul. From 338 B.C., there were the Olympian Games. There were the Pythian Games at the city of Delphi. There were the Nemean Games at Nemea, Isthmian Games over close to Corinth, and the Panathenic Games at Athens. All over the Greek, the Peloponnesus area, there were the games. And they took those games rather seriously, I understand. The first day of those games, the judges, everybody involved, the athletes would take a sacred oath, according to their gods, to go by the rules, to follow the rules. And then there was punishment if they didn't go by the rules. From what I read, during a race, if someone was cheating during the race or during the boxing match, during whatever contest it was, the judge might just go in there and start whipping the guy that was not competing according to the rules. Now, I don't know how Tom Brady would have liked that in Deflategate. Oh, did I? I'm sorry. But uh, we, we don't have that kind of barbaric system today, but they did. And they did something else. They uh, fined the players. This next slide is our, there were 16 statues of Zeus on the way to this stadium in Olympia. These are the bases of those statues. These statues were paid for by the fines of the people who cheated in the game. One of the first was in around 388 B.C., a boxer bribed three judges. He was caught. They fined him. What they did with people after that was they fined them 
took their money and used it to inscribe their names on these statues. So every time anybody played in the games after that, they could see the names of the cheaters all along the way. Paul's talking to this kind of crowd, a Greek crowd. He's writing to Ephesus. They would have understood Greek traditions. He's talking to this kind of crowd that says, we know that not playing according to the rules is not acceptable even in our pagan society, and it surely can't be acceptable to the one true and only God. The last fellow, I understand, that uh, had his name inscribed here was about 25 A.D., or one of the last, and his was because he got scared and fled the games before they started, the night before they started. He was the only person ever to have his name inscribed on one of these Zanes, as they were called, for the crime of cowardice. Now we're talking about being like men, aren't we? And we had a great lesson from Gail about not being cowards, but standing like men. Remember Revelation 21, verse 8? But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, sorcerers, sexually immoral, idolaters, and all liars shall be cast into the fire, hell of Fire and brimstone, lake of fire and brimstone. We don't want to be like that. So they were serious about their competitions very, very much. The competition then for Paul was used by him in his, in his letters uh, quite a bit, as you know. He talked about the crown. There were two kinds of crowns mentioned in the Bible. One was the diadem. It's on the dragon in Revelation chapter 12. It's on the beast in Revelation chapter 13. But it's on Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 19. The significance of it was that you, it des you deserved it just by being you. Now it's put ironically on the dragon. It's put ironically on the beast to show that they had power for a while. But it's put in reality, in truth, on the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings on Jesus Christ. A diadem is something like the King of England wears or something like that. He got it because he was born that way. Now Jesus Christ earned it by His sacrifice, I understand that. But a diadem was different from this kind of crown that we're talking about so much in the Scriptures, which is the Stephanos, and that was a crown that you got for winning the game. And that's what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25, everyone who striveth for the mastery, he's going after a crown. Now they do it for a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Their perishable crown was flowers. They weren't, that crown wasn't going to last a week. Wasn't even like a gold medal. They're doing all this work and all this striving for the mastery for a perishable crown, but we do it for an imperishable crown. The kind of crown that James talks about when he says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for after he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord gives to those who love him. The kind of crown that John Jesus spoke about in Revelation 2 to the church there, be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. The crown of life that Peter talked about, when the chief shepherd appears, these elders that serve well will receive the crown of glory. And the crown of life that Paul talked about, the crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8, I've fought the good fight, I've finished the course, I've kept the faith. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, and not for me only, but also for all them who have loved His appearing. Do you love His appearing enough to get the crown? That's the competition that we're in, not against each other, but with each other. We can help each other across the finish line. There's no penalty for that. We're not in this to be first. We're in this to be last, servant of all, and help other people across the finish line, we, as long as we get there. The competition then, we might have uh, fear that we do it in vain if we do it for a worldly competition. I might strive and try to win some particular race. I'm not going to win any races. I entered a 5K one time. I'm not going to win any races. I quit after that. I'm not going to win any. But this kind of crown, we can win just by finishing the race with the help of the one that we're following. Now, Paul talked about doing this in vain when he said in Galatians chapter 2, I conducted myself in a certain way when I went to Jerusalem. I went privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. He wrote to the Philippians in Philippians 2.16, and he said, I, uh, I'm glad that you're holding fast the word of life, lest by any means I might have run or labored in vain. I don't want my work to be in vain. And then of himself, Paul said, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. No one is going to gain the prize unless he competes according to the rules. And then we strive for excellence. You know that passage in 1 Corinthians 9. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Now everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. He's got his whole life involved. 
He's got his exercise hours. He's got his diets laid out. Everyone who striveth for the mastery, everyone who competes for the prize. You know what the Greek word is there? Agony. Agony needs of mine. Everybody's really, they're putting everything they have into it. Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we an imperishable crown. Thus I fight, or thus I run, not with uncertainty. I'm not going here and there. I'm not looking behind me. Straight ahead. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. Our Greek teacher from a while back talk, spoke of that as being, they had their fists wrapped in chain mail, fists wrapped in leather. It was like throwing a sledgehammer. You didn't waste any punches. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. We have commandments. We know the rules. I hear a lot about sound doctrine already today. I hear a lot about sound doctrine and following the commands of Christ and the law of Christ. Some of these verses I quoted earlier in the, in the elder session. We know the commands, 1 John 2, 3, and 4. Now by this you know that you know him if you keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in it. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. Somebody asked me one time at a job interview, do you believe in the love of God or are you a commandment keeper? I said, that's a false dichotomy. If you love me, Jesus, keep my commandments. You know, I didn't, I didn't get that job either. <laughs> uh, if you love me, keep my commandments, Jesus said. In many different ways in John 14 and 15, he said that. And that's the fullness of the faith. There are categories of obedience, I suppose. I might ask you to think about this. We're supposed to obey the government. I believe we know that. We're supposed to have every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Those governors are sent for the praise of those who do good and the punishment of evildoers, 1 Peter chapter 2. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, Paul wrote to Titus in Titus chapter 3. Unless, of course, they go against God. And then, what's the divine inspired example that we infer applies to us? We ought to obey God rather than men. Our primary source of instruction our rules, our rule book, if you will, comes from the Word of God, from divine authority, and we can't go back on it in any particular way, even if a government wants us to. And that's when it might get hard. That's when it might mean persecution. That's when it might mean jail. That's when it might mean separation from family. But can't get that crown of life if we don't compete according to the rules. We're at a disadvantage because the devil's a liar. He has no qualms about doing anything possible to get us off track. Do you ever think, feel like you're fighting a losing battle because everybody else on the immoral side of things, the end justifies the means. There's no integrity that they have to worry about, but we have to worry about integrity. Once again, the news gives you your illustrations. I saw this quote this morning on the Daily Apologist website. Whether the church knows it or not, we are all in a battle against an enemy that does not care about our families, has no rules of engagement, and has no regard for our feelings, but would love to use us as an example of defeat. The devil's a liar and the father of lies, and everything he does is going to cheat, and the end justifies the means. And if you go get those kind of people in power, then they're going to run right over you and have no integrity qualms about it. We have to have integrity, don't we? We have to do what's right, and we'll win in the end. 1980, Miracle on Ice, I was 15 years old. I knew nothing about hockey, never knew anything else since about hockey, but boy was I into that. Why? The Russians at that time, the rumor was, were just plain cheaters at everything they did. But these good old amateur American boys came and walked them. And it felt like there was some justice. There will be justice in the last day. And the powerful God is on our side against all the liars and cheaters. We've got to compete according to the rules. Thank you.